Hello, uh, good morning. Um, I hope that you can see and hear me okay. Uh, I'm Stephen Tromans. I'm chairing this morning's Northern Region webinar on planning and environmental law from 3906 Chambers. And with me are John Pugh Smith and Christian Swart. Uh, we're very sorry that we're not doing this personally in one of the great cities of the Northern Region, uh, but uh, we are where we are in current circumstances. And I'm very pleased that you're with us with so many others. Uh, I've seen the, the attendance list, there's some um, you know, well-known well uh, faces there. So uh, welcome to you. Um, before we start, uh, if, if we just uh, move on uh, with the, the slides uh, and then I'll give you a little, uh, yes. So uh, if you could just use the Q&A facility on Zoom, that would be, uh, very helpful. I'm sure you're all kind of quite familiar with, with Zoom now and how it works. If you ask any questions in that way, we'll do our best to answer them one way or another. And uh, when we get to the end, there's a slide which gives sort of contact details and so on. But um, you just would like to be aware of, I think, uh, the various other 1396 resources we have in planning and environment and property and indeed other fields. We have a regular newsletter. Uh, we have these webinars which are, are available. Uh, podcasts and uh, vlogs, I believe they're called, uh, all sorts of things uh, on our uh, website. A rich cornucopia, I think you could say, of resources. So worth having a look at that, uh, I think, when you feel uh, able or when you'd like some further information. And um, we do have, uh, after Christmas, some uh, more seminars planned. We're going to have one in January looking at the environment bill as it's now going through parliament again uh, an in-depth look at that so you may want to keep an eye on that and uh, some of us will be presenting the state of play on that bill um, so uh, I think really without more, more ado uh, I can move on to my further introductory remarks the content is I'm going to say a few words not not a great deal but uh, an issue of the, the question of economic and linked environmental recovery in the region Christian is going to be talking about uh, SIL and Little SIL, uh, the future SIL on financing infrastructure, obviously a crucially important issue for, for the region. And John has uh, 10 uh, nuts and bumps cases comprising the 2020 planning toolbox, which I hope you'll find useful. And uh, so um, you'll have, I'm sure you'll have, you'll have read the uh, government or read about the government's 10-point plan, 18th of November, for a, quote, green industrial revolution. And that is, of course, all part of the so-called levelling up agenda, um, transformation from a, what is inaccurately, I think, a picture of it being grim up north to a very bright environmentally led future. But I think it's we, we all know, don't we, and it's striking and salutary to look at the the map uh, introduced in consideration of the new tiers of COVID, how much has been, um, how much the North relative to the South has been affected both in health terms and economic terms. So there is a huge amount to do. So the government's 10 point plan, uh, it's very vague at the moment, of course, but um, at least we know the bare bones of it. So big emphasis on green industry, offshore wind, uh, nuclear, hydrogen technologies, carbon capture use, use and storage, uh, a, a lot more uh, emphasis on green finance. And I think the idea of green finance bank being located in the north of, of England. Uh, tree planting is obviously a very, very big thing. Uh, I said a few words about tree planting uh, in, in my uh, vlog, which you can access on the, the, the website and uh, growth in natural protection of the environment and re Wilding. Of course, some of these are not entirely consistent. There may be tensions between some of these. Um, so just moving on, dealing with offshore wind. Um, we have a little flat in the northeast looking out over the North Sea, North Tyneside. We look out over a little wind farm, nothing near as big as that. But there's likely to be a lot more offshore wind, I think, in the North Sea. The Northeast is going to be a big focus for this. And of course, both traditional wind technology and the new generation of floating turbines uh, will be important. And going with that, plainly, both investment in ports and manufacturing of these, these pieces of kit and of um, the necessary infrastructure. And we have a, a review coming up of 
offshore transmission. You know, the, the siting of these things offshore is actually possibly less controversial than the, the, the major infrastructure needed to get the energy onshore, as we know from Norfolk and other, other places. So hydrogen, well, we're, I think, becoming gradually familiar or maybe not so familiar with the different shades of hydrogen, blue, green or grey, but certainly the government has huge uh, ambitions for the uh, production of low carbon hydrogen, so hydrogen that's produced principally from renewable sources. Uh, we're seeing the idea of hubs where you would have the congregation of renewable energy, carbon capture, use, storage and hydrogen. So a lot of that will be plainly uh, in, in the north, although not exclusively. There is, for instance, the strong possibility of hydrogen production taking place at the EDF nuclear power stations being developed at Inkley Point and uh, possibly at Sizewell. We're going to be seeing a, a hydrogen strategy from the government next year. And of course, we already have quite an emphasis in the region of Tees Valley on hydrogen transport. It's probably worth saying uh, for those involved in regulatory work that obviously a lot of this does involve a significant amount of new regulation. We don't really have a framework at the moment to regulate hydrogen production uh, and uh, hydrogen distribution. So that, that is a major task actually that shouldn't be underestimated, getting that regulatory framework into place. Nuclear. Uh, we have at least one more uh, large scale reactor uh, on the government's uh, sites, and that would obviously be at size well if that goes, goes ahead. Hopefully it will. Um, also an emphasis on both small modular reactors produced in factories, uh, which can be um, simply installed much more readily on their location and advanced modular reactors uh, with operating at much greater temperatures. Uh, and producing heat to produce both hydrogen and synthetic fuels. No reason why a number of those shouldn't be located in, in the north and seems to be highly likely that they, they will, given the emphasis on uh, the, the northwest coast as a centre of excellence for nuclear technology. And the government proposes four industrial clusters or terms super places, bringing together uh, advanced modular reactors and um, carbon capture use and storage. So there'll be also a lot of emphasis on regulation, research, supply chains, and a long way further down the line, fusion energy um, with the um, spherical uh, tokamak uh, fusion reactor uh, funds going to develop that. Well, maybe a bit of strategy fatigue coming in here. I know Boris is a bit slimmer these days, uh, but um, Obviously, there's a lot going to be coming out in terms of strategy on national infrastructure, uh, the, the delayed energy white paper, the uh, revision of the national policy statements, both on energy and on nuclear, um, hydrogen strategy I've mentioned already, industrial decarbonisation strategy, um, net zero uh, strategy, uh, strategy for trees, and also natural strategy. So that's not going to happen before Christmas, I don't think. It'd be a very big stocking if all that's in it. Uh, but certainly in 2021, uh, we're going to be getting uh, all of that work. And we, we'll keep you informed on that. I'm sure we'll be having discussions in webinars uh, in 2021 on all of these strategies going forward. Thanks very much. Uh, so that's all I want to say. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Christian uh, on a, a very topic he's very, very familiar and with an expert in, which is SIL. Hello, everyone. I'm Christian Salt. I'm going to talk to you this morning about SIL today and uh, tomorrow uh, for about 15 minutes. Uh, I'm a foster child of the Northeast, having studied and lived up there for many years. And um, hopefully uh, I can also point you to the uh, SIL briefing notes that are published on our website. Uh, on a variety of topics that we publish periodically and there are more to come. Um, for now though I, uh, I'm going to discuss SIL today and SIL tomorrow. The, the, the start point as always is why is SIL so complicated? So if we can just go back uh, to, to, to that slide. Well it, it's, it's complicated because it is a complicated regime to start with. It straddles both town and country planning and also tax, and it's a, a, a hybrid of both schemes, takes a bit from both, but is its own bespoke uh, sphere. 
And so taking Ariadne's thread, you always need a cold towel when looking at any kind of seal problem um, because you have to obviously adjust your, your mindset. And I think going forwards, that complexity is going to be here to stay just in a different form. So back to basics, essentially, if we go back to uh, where we are today, uh, there are two uh, routes to taxing development of hope value. There's the traditional route, which is um, section 72C, material considerations, and that brings in essentially, as you'll recall, planning obligations. And these they are the traditional vehicle for negotiating sums of money, providing affordable housing uh, and other forms of infrastructure. And we're all used to the case law and the former guidance in relation to those. And we know obviously that SIL regulation 122 uh, regulates now, codifies uh, the application uh, and utility planning obligations by use of quite strict criteria that brings them back into line with how they used to be and requires obviously a direct relationship between the obligation and the um, uh, 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 site itself. And you recall that there are planning judgments embedded now in regulation 1222A to C that, that are required to be made. That there's also now since 2010, what was originally the labor vehicle of um, the SIL regulations, which are embedded in the section 72B as a local finance consideration. And uh, these uh, encompass both grants by the Secretary of State under subsection 4B and also SIL. So Parliament's made finance material to planning, um, but you need to keep subsection 2B separate from subsection 2C. And we know that regulation 122 and 1223 does that. So for those of you that, that um, haven't already embarked on the exercise, there's obviously a new skill set uh, in train, which is how do you assess the weight that you attribute to the SIL as any other material consideration uh, in, the, in, the, in the development planning exercise. So just as you give weight to the green belt or to housing or to addressing some sort of need, um, you know, one has to think about these things. Uh, one example I give is, what if you have a bridge that costs hundred pounds to provide locally and the seal contribution to it by one development will be 99 pounds out of hundred? Um, should that be given a lot of weight simply because it's a lot of the percentage of the uh, price of the infrastructure? Conversely, when the next development comes along, which, for example, provides the last pound, should that be given a lot of weight because it actually enables delivery? And these are questions uh, which need to be obviously addressed by uh, officers, but also advisors to take advantage of this material consideration. Uh, if not before, then, then do so now. The SIL regulations, therefore, provide the framework for that. And it's important to remember that um, the charging authority and the collective authorities have very few discretions under regulations. The regulations are not the creature of a local authority. So however much one may rail against the uh, application of those regulations by the local authority, they very much have their hands tied in relation to what they can and can't do. And then ultimately, uh, SIL is a local revenue uh, raising mechanism for infrastructure. Now, I continue with the basics uh, as, a, a, as a reminder of the genesis and purpose of SIL. It is essentially a levy or tax on net new development. And I highlight that in red because the golden thread running through the whole of the SIL regime is to focus on the net new. So all of the equations, the formulae, the abatement provisions, the uh, ability to uh, jump from one planning permission to the next, the new schedule, uh, provisions uh, in the uh, September 2019 iteration of um, the regulations, they are all directed to establishing what is the net new development resulting that requires then to be charged. It's also helpful to remember that although SIL derives from the Planning Act 2008, although entitled Planning Act 2008, it's not one of the defined Planning Acts under Section 336 of the Town and Country Planning Act. Rather, part 11 is its own discrete regime, uh, and it starts off in section 205, one, very importantly, with the joint authorship that one has to remember of the regulations. Quote, the Secretary of State may, with the consent of the Treasury, make regulations, unquote. So that is uh, important to remember from the outset that when you're reading the regulations, they have the Treasury's imprimatur all over them. And from a taxation perspective, that becomes clear when you look at the very discrete purposes that we see. 
uh, embedded in them. So the important factor is to approach uh, interpretation of the serial regulation as a tax. And this was underscored in the early case of Orbital, where a, a whole range of tax uh, cases were deployed by the local authority to fend off, uh, so uh, uh, in order to establish the correct meaning of the um, uh, uh, provisions there under challenge. The purpose of SIL overall is in relation to maintaining viability of development of the area and not of a particular development. That's also important to remember. Another important factor is that the statutory definitions uh, are both wide and different. So infrastructure is uh, uh, drawn widely and inclusive. Uh, and if you look at the pictures uh, on the slides that I've produced uh, on the right, you'll see they could cover anything from um, the, the quaking infrastructure of a city to a scout hut. It, it, it's a very, very wide panoply of uh, potential things that one could provide. Also very importantly, uh, development, if we can go back a moment, please. Development is um, defined differently to the Town and Country Planning Act definition of development. And part 11 carves out that difference uh, and is a recipe for confusion because as a planner, one would read, as, as I do, uh, the regulations, see the word development, assume uh, naturally that it means the same thing as the Town and Country Planning Act, but it doesn't. Uh, and this is causing obviously uh, a great deal of confusion and premature commencement uh, of uh, liability to the charge. So remember that uh, in part two of the regulations, you have very uh, discrete definitions and purposes, which are spelt out for being part 11 of the Planning Act 2008. It's a very fact sensitive regime, uh, but at its heart, it's always only trying to uh, grapple with the net new development, which is falling to be taxed. In relation to appeals and cases, um, there is a website um, uh, that the government runs where all the valuation uh, agency appeals are published. They're redacted, which makes it almost impossible to read them and make sense of them. And they're obviously very fact sensitive. They give a flavor of the approach of officers to uh, the cases, but really no more than that. Um, there are perhaps unsurprisingly very few uh, high court cases uh, about SIL because by the time one goes to our judicial review, uh, the decisions of local authorities often, um, development has moved on, the market's moved on, and it's not frankly worth the candle to challenge these things. And this is reflected in, in less than 10 cases about SIL. The early cases looked at uh, challenging the um, scheduled option process, uh, which was a hopeless challenge, albeit it, the judgment went to many, many hundreds of paragraphs to, to, to explain the, the same. The Our Hope uh, Limited pub case was quite useful in relation to the meaning of in lawful use, meaning actual use needed to be shown of the land in relation to the former Regulation 40 formula. So that's one to remember. Orbital is very useful because it essentially underscores the point, as is usual in tax, that it's permissible to avoid tax rather than evade it. And you can legitimately split up applications if you want to minimize your, your tax liability. More recently, a couple of cases on prescribed uh, requirements of the regulations in relation to demand notices and liability notices in the Hillingdon and the Shropshire cases, and a reminder that these are regulatory notices and have to be gotten right because ultimately they are the genesis of the of the um, they're the notice of uh, the taxation uh, uh, liability and also they are a demand in relation to the particular amount. I just highlight the Oval case that came out in January 2020. That was by um, Swift J, uh, who is a, a former uh, Treasury Council. Uh, and uh, he did two things. One is he underscored that the liability to SIL is generated by the initial grant of planning permission. So in the, in the Planning Act sphere, we would assume that the planning permission encompasses under outline planning permission, for example, reserve matters, uh, approval and so on and so forth, and modification subsequently. However, under the SIL regime, it's the initial grant of outline planning permission in that particular case that was the relevant chargeable development, notwithstanding that there were still reserved uh, matters approvals to be obtained. So again, this resulted in um, the scope of liability being much wider than the developer had anticipated. The second aspect he underscored is essentially he doesn't want to see, and the courts don't want to see, uh, SIL cases coming to the courts because they should be able to be dealt with 
uh, locally. So there, even though the um, formal entitlements to review and appeal uh, had gone, uh, he strongly encouraged informal uh, processes that mirrored those uh, regulatory entitlements. And so I would very much encourage that, whether you're a local authority or you're uh, a lawyer, to uh, adopt that parallel process, if only as a means of trying to narrow the issues to see whether things can't be resolved rather than going to judicial review. Now, what about SIL tomorrow? Well, we heard from um, Stephen earlier about the uh, range of uh, papers that are being produced by the government about what's going to happen next. And uh, we know that the uh, August 2020 white paper in planning has been recently produced and also earlier this uh, year, the free ports consultation process. Um, and in relation to the planning white paper, it proposes fundamental reform. You'll have heard lots and lots about the white paper. You'll recall that it moves from a golden thread to three pillars, obviously jettisoning um, Lawrence of Arabia's seven pillars. The government thinks that three are plenty. We're planning for development. We're planning for a beautiful and sustainable place. And we're planning for infrastructure and connected places. So highlighting in this particular discussion, pillar three, the planning for infrastructure and connected places, that's proposing essentially a nationally set value-based flat rate charge known as the infrastructure levy, IL for short. And that's aiming to capture a greater share of uplift in land value that comes with development. Now we can anticipate therefore that development is going to get a lot more expensive for reasons which I think will become clear. And we can also see from the Freeport's government response that chapter five ties to planning uh, and also committed development and also chapter six refers to the regeneration of the surrounding area, including commercial housing development. So the government's obviously looking to Brexit and the uh, regeneration potential of Freeport, particularly, for example, in the northern region where there are many different types of port, whether they are uh, uh, sea, uh, air, uh, or land or logistics uh, situations as essentially hotspots for development. And the context is as well that, uh, for example, as the white paper sets out, that in the 2018 to 2019 period, some £7 billion of planning obligations were negotiated, of which just shy of £5 billion for affordable housing was negotiated which translates into the equivalent of about 30,000 homes. So there's obviously a, a, a big carrot there for the Treasury to try and capture in some way uh, and encompass that uh, amount of revenue uh, by uh, one means or another. And as the paper uh, uh, sets out, it does recognise that negotiations equate to delay and what they describe as unevenness, which I think is a way of trying to say that some developers are bigger than others and therefore uh, different developers lose out in different ways through the negotiations. So the reform proposed is the consolidated infrastructure levy. So although, um, as it were, the doomsters and gloomsters who dislike SIL may think it's gone, in fact, it's going to be uh, mutated into simply a different form of SIL. Um, tomorrow's uh, scope of infrastructure levy, SIL, is going to uh, apparently sweep away months of negotiations, so remove delay. Importantly, it's going to have an expanded scope to cover uh, affordable housing. It's going to remove exemptions in order to capture changes of use through permitted development, which I think is a very important consideration. There's going to be more on-site affordable housing. So as developers obviously are interested in moving uh, affordable housing off-site in order to increase on-site values, I think we're going to see an injunction to on-site in some ways. So maybe the outcome of that will be differently designed developments. And also an increased flexibility for uh, still use by local authorities. So ultimately, as the white paper describes, a faster, more certain means to capture more hope value and therefore make development more expensive. Now, pillar three, we are in the uh, age of the algorithm. We, we've all experienced the, the Google adverts and the Amazon Prime adverts popping up all over our, our screens and we've seen the housing algorithm and SIL is very much part of the algorithm. It's littered with formulae at the moment and we're going to see more formulae probably in, in, in new regulations when they emerge. 
the benefits of um, still are, are extolled in the white paper as being a, a, a flat rate and a non-negotiable tariff, but the government's identified that the payment point, the commencement point, is inflexible in relation to market conditions. As we saw in the Oval case, liability was triggered very early at the point of grant of an outline planning permission, and that's seen as problematic and also, as one might anticipate, problematic for cash flow because it means suddenly there's a liability to pay which may not have been thought through or profiled financially over the course of the lifetime of the development. And in addition, local authorities are apparently slow to spend still on early delivery of infrastructure, uh, probably because they haven't got much money from central government by other means. So a proposal is uh, for the consolidated infrastructure levy. In relation to the white paper, uh, we're concerned with three proposals. Proposal 19 is to mesh Section 106 and SIL. Proposal 20 is to expand the levy base to encompass permitted development and also importantly, I think, use. And proposal 21 is to include affordable housing in SIL. So what we see is the Treasury continues to essentially see SIL as a very, very useful revenue raising uh, uh, machine uh, from, uh, to, to, to uh, capture an increasing part of the development um, hope value. Now, what about the proposal 19 content? Well, if we go to the white paper itself and we look at the language of it, it starts to become clear. And it's one can start to discern the likely equation shape and content that we're going to see, uh, as we're all familiar with the SIL equations now in, in Schedule 1. Um, there's going to be a flat rate value based charge nationally set. So that's more central government control over the, the, the situation. There's either going to be a single rate or an area specific rate. I would guess that an area specific rate is more likely in, all, in, in line with the leveling up agenda, maybe regional, perhaps not as granular as uh, county or district, uh, but we'll see how that um, pans out. And Quite interestingly, it's going to be charged on the final value of development. Um, so rather than uh, uh, looking at the front loading uh, of, of value, it's going to look at the end point, which will obviously uh, accommodate rises in the, the market value over time. And in many ways, will incentivize developers to build out more quickly in a rising market, perhaps, so that they can not suppress, but take advantage of a a lower value point in the SIL equation rather than waiting around uh, and, and the price is only going up, the value is only going up. And the, the rate will be the data grant of permission. So that mechanical situation may result to uh, accelerate actual delivery of homes. It's going to be levied at the point of occupation rather than uh, liability at the point of commencement. So we'll have to see how that is um, uh, uh, articulated, but essentially that's going to uh, result in pushing back the, the point at which the charge is likely to have to be paid, whereas at the moment you'll recall it has to be paid pretty much uh, close to commencement. There's anticipated to be a minimum threshold to prevent lack of viability, and there'll be a levy apparently only above threshold, but only above the threshold of part. So it sounds as if there's going to be a uh, uh, a point above which, in relation to all development, uh, one will have to pay um, the infrastructure levy, but below which uh, one won't. That may result in developments being potentially permissibly split out in order to ensure that as much development remains below threshold as possible. And as now, local authorities can borrow against SIL and they're anticipated to borrow against infrastructure levy much in the same way as in uh, London, you have the uh, mayoral seal, which is used to engender funds for, for example, Crossrail. What about mechanics? Well, you'll recall um, in the Northern region that seal coverage is um, patchy, partly because of land values. Um, you'll recall that there is seal currently in the Cheshire uh, parts in Preston, in Sheffield, in Leeds, in Newcastle, and North Tyneside, in Hambleton and Rydale as well. Elsewhere, you recall that there is emerging SIL and um, somewhere uh, in other parts, wider parts, mainly in the more rural districts, you recall that there is no SIL and there are simply Section 106. And the white paper is, is quite clear about this um, patchiness 
and is anticipating uh, potentially having a seal threshold set locally. Uh, and that's probably going to be unlikely. I think the regional approach probably is more sensible. But as the um, white paper indicates, um, as planning obligations will be consolidated into single infrastructure levy, the government anticipates significantly greater uptake of SIL. Well, as I've indicated, they're not kidding, because if you can't get money through Section 106, you're going to be driven to adopt a single infrastructure levy one way or the other. So those areas that don't yet have uh, SIL are going to get it in due course one way or the other. Another option in the white paper is in relation to um, the potential to capitalise land value to ensure landowners contribute something. And you recall one of the background points uh, that the government is concerned about is landowners doing deals with developers in order to in some way uh, modify the land value in order to um, uh, inform how the value of land is, is charged. Uh, and so this is something obviously under consideration. So in, in the, in the post-Brexit and virus pro-leveling up government world, we're looking to tax new builds and to refine the infrastructure equation. And as we've just seen recently, removal, thank goodness at last, of the Southeast bias. So what about um, tomorrow's SIL? And in conclusion, what might it look like in practice? Well, the SIL regs are, have been iteratively refined since 2010. Their latest iteration is September 2019. They've been progressively refined in order to make them more pragmatic, more workable, and that's exposing um, fewer and fewer uh, operable uh, issues but is bringing into stark relief the inflexibility of the commencement payment points, for example. So we can anticipate uh, simply recast SIL regulations as infrastructure levy regulations um, with reform triggers in relation to commencement, first permitting and liability, which are the key triggers. Importantly, I think a reform scope of development to include uh, use. And th this is important for this reason. The, the white paper is very clear about the uh, potential to expand the revenue base of SIL. And at the moment, you remember that development and the um, formulae are focused upon SIL being levied on the creation of new floor space. And essentially, that's, that's uh, directed by the guidance to mean really where you've created a new physical envelope, which contains some kind of uh, floor area. What's been left moot and has been uh, troublesome for some time is, is can you levy simply on a change of use, for example, from a shop to an office in the high street uh, or from a shop to a home? Well, it's quite clear from the white paper that that kind of development, simply changing the land use, uh, is going to be caught by SIL. So suddenly um, it's going to get a lot more expensive to uh, uh, develop because where before one thought one needed to build something, simply changing use is going to generate a seal charge. Obviously, it's quite clear from the white paper that um, section 106 is going to be removed, quote unquote, and um, uh, uh, that's going to see a meshing of the section 106 finance provisions with the infrastructure levy regulations and seal regulations are therefore going to encompass affordable housing. There are already provisions for in-kind delivery, and those look like they're going to be expanded to ensure on-site delivery. Um, and there's also a suggestion in the white paper about the discount for providers uh, somehow being embedded in the in-kind delivery provisions. Um, there's also provision for uh, offsets and incentivizing provisions for offset uh, of, of uh, values and so forth. So, in relation to the uh, definitions in section 70 of the Town Country Planning Act, which we looked at at the start of this discussion, local finance consideration could easily be refined to, instead of meaning community infrastructure levy, could simply mean infrastructure levy. Question, section 106, will it be removed? Well, it doesn't need to be removed because only certain subsections concern sums. Might we anticipate repeal of those uh, subsections? Possibly, the government white paper indicates removal of section 106, but it may be in practice that the regulations result to confine 
what sums might be able to be put through section 106 as it stands and carves out all of those others that may not be. So in conclusion, I think uh, at the very end, if we go to the final slide, we know from Boris and his uh, Round Britain tour uh, uh, this time last year, he was injuncting to build, build, build. Is there going to be reform? Yes. Is there going to be fundamental reform? I think financially, yes, in particular in relation to the expansion of the scope of infrastructure levy to encompass uh, use. And um, similarly, you'll see from the free ports um, white paper and discussion uh, in the consultation process, it's seen as a test bed for some of the wider planning reforms. So one can anticipate as there's a rush to develop free ports and uh, associated um, housing and commercial development, there may also be a rush to generate sill and revenue from that as well. So bonanza in many different ways for many different people. So lastly, sill is certainly here to stay, but as always, it's important to buy in at the right price and sell out at the right price. So that's all from me and now over to John, thank you. Well, <clears throat> I've got a strike rate of about one case every one and a half minutes, a bit like power play in the current T20 in South Africa. So I am going to be covering 10 cases uh, at uh, fairly fast speeds. Uh, there will be um, these slides available after the webinar. And also there are a number of articles and podcasts that both myself and Stephen have written as well, which uh, may assist together with those from our colleagues and indeed in our forthcoming newsletter. So of the 10 cases in the toolbox, these are the key ones that I think uh, you should be aware of. Um, DB Symmetry on interpretation of planning conditions and their lawfulness. Uh, Norfolk Homes on the interpretation of Section 106 agreements, particularly in a Section 73 context. Pillar Investments on what is a policy in terms of whether it's current or out of date for housing purposes. Uh, Sam Smith, uh, not only on Greenbelt openness, but on material considerations. Um, Liverpool Open Spaces also on the issue of openness, uh, albeit in the Green Wedge context, but perhaps uh, the current and um, maybe even concluded view of the Court of Appeal on that issue. Locarda deals uh, with the issue uh, in a neighbourhood planning context, particularly in terms of the adequacy or lack of reasons where you depart from national policy, in that case, to do with um, green space. Dill on the meaning of a building in the listed context. Retria homes on the interpretation of policy, particularly in the uh, C2 extra care, um, care home um, discussion and debate. Uh, Hillside on the approach now being taken by the courts and modern planning permissions and effectively um, the uh, long stop now for further arguments about issue estoppel. And finally, Hawkehurst, uh, which has an interesting discussion on uh, what does severe adverse uh, highway impacts means uh, in real terms. So let's start with DB symmetry. Now this raised two issues, and it may be that the case goes to the court of, uh, from the Court of Appeal to the Supreme Court. Uh, the first was on the lawfulness of conditions, uh, purporting to give a public right of way over a development and uh, whether or not that implied dedication. And secondly, uh, general guidance on the interpretation of planning conditions. Now, as far as the outcome was confirmed, uh, the view that was taken that the principle included a requirement the public have a right of way over the land. So if that wasn't clear, then there was no need for formal dedication and that there are other means of achieving that without actual dedication. On the second issue, uh, interpreting planning conditions, the Court of Appeal set out a lot of very helpful, very sensible guidance. And uh, one notices with the last bullet point, where, where there is a choice, uh, what the court will give preference to is the interpretation which actually results in the permission being held to be valid. So let's move on to Norfolk Homes, a case dear to my heart because uh, it's involved uh, my local authority, also dear to my heart, as a neutral dispute resolver where these sorts of issues have been raised. And essentially, uh, the argument that was being run by the District Council was that uh, although there was no linkage between the original Section 106 
and subsequent Section 73 variations, nonetheless, the underlying obligation to provide affordable housing still remained um, live and uh, enforceable. And that uh, there must be uh, some sort of implication there, or indeed, uh, perhaps even uh, a local authority falling into a technical trap if somebody were to take such a legalistic point. This case, uh, which is a subject of two articles by me uh, during the course of this year, actually comes down at the end of the day to a very clear judgment from Mr. Justice Holgate that the uh, well-established principles in the Supreme Court for the interpretation of deeds uh, ending up in Woods and Capita uh, most recently apply in this instance, uh, section 106 is a deed, whether in binatural or unilateral form, and therefore it must be interpreted and only interpreted on that basis and any uh, attempts to include implied um, provisions within it uh, ran a, a course that could only be disastrous in the longer term and in the wider public interest. The sadness of the whole outcome is, of course, that the local authority has missed out on 45% affordable housing, which in this instance equates to about 30 units uh, and uh, quite a meaningful contribution that could otherwise have been made uh, within an area of the country that has come increasingly and particularly attractive during 2020. Uh, because it's low rates of COVID infection. Might add we're, gonna, we're in tier two from today. Peel investments. This hopefully puts to bed the discussion as to what an out-of-date policy means uh, for the purpose of uh, the 11D uh, presumption in the current uh, framework. And in that regard, uh, interpretation has to be looked at uh, upon this particular basis that whether a policy is out of date is a matter of pure planning judgment, is not dependent on legal interpretation. And one has to look at that also in the context of whether or not the underlying objectives, particularly the achievement of sustainable development, are still being um, effectively given um, <clears throat> promotion uh, as a result of that policy, even though it's uh, sell by date or use best by date may have passed. The other uh, aspect which uh, one needs to look at in this regard uh, is, of course, the way in which these matters will now come forward and picking up a point that Christian touched upon in terms of encouraging more development at a quicker pace, particularly in the residential market and also on plan making being encouraged as well. Again, this uh, is no excuse uh, to allow old plans to stay in force for longer than is absolutely essential. So let's move on to Sam Smith, two issues here. Uh, the first on the meaning of openness. And of course, this was in the context of a quarry extension uh, in the Green Belt. And the view that was expressed by the Supreme Court, indeed through the last judgment of Lord Carnworth, was that openness is a broad concept that essentially, it, whilst visual qualities may have an impact upon it, nonetheless, it comes down to the extent to which the absence of built development may or may not be apparent. The other aspect is material considerations. And again, Lord Carnworth's judgment helpfully sets out uh, what are material considerations and uh, gives, again, a common sense approach to this particular issue. And of course, bringing the th two threads together, the view there taken by the Supreme Court endorsing that at first instance that visual impact didn't fall into either category, in other words, in terms of openness in this particular instance, and that uh, the matter had been uh, correctly dealt with by the decision maker, in this case, North Yorkshire County Council. Liverpool um, is a subsequent case. Um, it was uh, the second of two cases uh, this year, the other one big hook that dealt with this issue back in that particular court. And these are perhaps the uh, last words on the matter, certainly emanating from Lord Justice Limblom or um, Sir Keith Limblom, president, as he's now been elevated to being within the Court of Appeal. And that, in this context, is that one has to look at the realistic and common sense aspects uh, when looking at Greenbelt development. And that can include visual as well as physical or spatial impacts. So let's. Um, wait and see what happens, but uh, it's unlikely, given the way in which the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court are trying to codify or recodify planning law, that we will see much more jurisprudence on this, certainly at this particular level. But 
Uh, in the uh, neighborhood planning context in Loch Arlott, which was a decision uh, that came after uh, Liverpool, uh, the matter was looked at in the context of uh, a local a neighborhood plan policy on um, local green space. And the view of the court there was that if you're going to depart from it, you've got to give reasons, as none were provided either by um, the parish council in its NDP making process or could be found in an examiner's report, uh, then the policy had to be quashed. But the case is also useful because it actually looks at the role of the uh, examiner. Uh, and although it differs from that of planning inspectors, nonetheless, um, it is uh, <clears throat> based on a presumption of expertise. And of course, as reflected in the RICS panel members who are drawn uh, for that particular purpose in terms of their qualifications. Moving on to Dill now, this case uh, is important in two respects because it deals with not only whether or not you can challenge a listing at appeal uh, uh, against an uh, a list of building enforcement notice, but also what constitutes a building. And of course, the, the context in this instance uh, were two lead urns which had actually been removed and sold by the owner of the property in question within Stratford upon Avon's administrative area. On the first issue, uh, the view of the court was that uh, the, the right to challenge was something that had to be upheld. And on the second, uh, applying the Skerritt's tests of um, whether or not size, permanence, degree of physical attachment were appropriate uh, to, uh, to uh, be applicable to an urn, came to the view uh, that uh, clearly that was inapplicable in this particular instance. Um, they also pointed out there should be uh, guidance issued by the government on freestanding structures. The uh, postscript to this is, of course, the matter got remitted back to the Secretary of State, and at that stage, uh, Stratford decided to withdraw the uh, enforcement notice. So eventually, justice was not only seen to be done, but actually done and achieved in a rather meaningful but rather protracted process. Moving on to Retria Homes now, this case has been of particular interest to the retirement housing sector with which I'm uh, extensively involved. And it arose in the context essentially of a new um, developer to uh, the market, Retria Homes, who uh, weren't keen because of viability to pay a substantial sum for an affordable housing contribution under policy CSH3 of South Oxfordshire's core strategy. So the matter went uh, eventually after uh, an unsuccessful appeal to uh, the uh, High Court. And in that um, judgment, which uh, Mr. Justice Holgate um, delivered um, in late summer, he set out uh, 10 principles of interpretation, which I, looking at the time, will not take you through. But uh, what is uh, of particular help here is the structural way in which he sets it out in his judgment. As far as the outcomes were concerned, uh, the view that was taken was that um, essentially, unless your scheme is designed uh, not to actually connote separate dwellings, uh, then uh, you were caught by a, a policy of this kind. Equally, uh, just because your scheme fell within C2 didn't mean it was exempt from contributions because you could have dwellings within a care home because of their configuration, for example, separate front doors uh, or beer with shared accommodation um, for eating and um, recreation. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the policy would still bite. Again, interesting postscript on this one that subsequently Rectory Homes have put forward uh, an offer for the full financial contribution. So uh, we will have to see the outcome of a read submission uh, on that basis. But certainly it's uh, an issue of plan making as well. And given the requirement increasingly to uh, provide housing for the older generations, the importance of ensuring that policy isn't so prescriptive in terms of seeking affordable housing, that uh, there is no means by which um, a scheme that uh, clearly relies on viability because of the way in which retirement has to be promoted in terms of complete build out, that that won't kibosh the scheme. But uh, anyway, maybe um, if the white paper proposals for catching affordable housing through the new CIL um, proposal is uh, uh, taken up, uh, then this sort of issue will drop away. So let's move on to case nine, Hillside Parks. 
essentially, this matter comes down to whether or not principles of res judicata or issue estoppel are still applicable um, when you're looking uh, at uh, a set of circumstances in 2020 with a historic permission, but also whether or not once you started to build out a scheme, um, certainly a large scheme, in this case 401 houses, that uh, that uh, saved you for all time, what was known as the Lucas exception. Now, in terms of the outcomes of this case, uh, the, the view of the Court of Appeal in very trenchant terms was that there have been sufficient legal developments in the law since even 1987 uh, that uh, no longer could, as it were, the issue at stoppable point be taken fairly uh, in this instance. And the cases of Sage and Singh are referred to them. On the Lucas exception, I think the key point to pick out here is what Lord Justice Singh uh, had to say that really uh, not only uh, was that case highly exceptional because it turned on its own particular facts, hadn't been endorsed by any appeal court, but most importantly, a modern um, large housing scheme has so many component parts, you cannot, uh, as it were, address the issues of commencement and uh, saving of, of schemes simply on an isolated manner. And you had to look at it holistically because of the various interlocking parts, for example, highways, landscaping, and even employment and educational uses. So we get to the last case, Hawkehurst, uh, Hawkehurst is, is interesting uh, in two respects. Uh, one, because of the fact that this was the first time that the High Court has had to deal with the issue of uh, the paragraphs uh, 108 and 109 on severe highway impacts, but also the way in which the court approached the overall resolution of the matter. So unsurprisingly, one finds that as the definition of severe residual cumulative impacts is not defined within the framework. It's a matter of planning judgment. And of course, in that regard, it's a case of what is before the decision maker, in this case, Tunbridge Wells Borough Council, and the way they look at matters, uh, as it were, in their overall context. And of course, the second and related point to this is the fact that the that, that retirement housing, in this case, a McCarthy and Stone scheme, by their very nature, have very, very low traffic impacts. And that lighter touch approach, not only in terms of the requirement for perhaps a not so comprehensive transport statement, but also in terms of impacts had to be looked at in the round. And of course, at the end of the day, uh, the, the outcome could come nowhere near the irrational bar that was required to quash the particular decision. So there we are. I've got there uh, just, I hope, within time, Stephen. Uh, this is the uh, supplementary reading list that is on offer, including Stephen's forthcoming um, article the newsletter foreshadowed uh, in a webinar that he did recently about the the hillside case and a visit to uh, a number of historic cases so thank you very much Any thank questions? you thank you both that's great thanks um thank you both for getting through so much so efficiently now um there is one question that's been asked uh online for christian i think which is is there likely to be any change to parish sill payments, uh, i.e. the 15% or 20% with a neighbourhood plan? Christian, I don't know whether you're able to deal with that for us uh, now. Thank you very much. I'll do my best. That's, that's my starter for 10. Yeah. Uh, in a nutshell, those listening or watching will remember that the sill regulations provided in Regulation 59D for sill payments to local communities. And in a nutshell, um, where you have a parish council, um, some 15% of SIL funds uh, are applied to the parish council upon receipt of SIL. So it acts as a, a revenue raising machine for a parish council very helpfully. And if there is also an enabled plan uh, in relation to that uh, parish council area, then the 15% goes up to uh, 25%. So there's a clear central government incentive financially to adopt a neighbourhood plan if you're uh, in a parish council because you get a, a, a quarter of the receipts for government in your area, which is fantastic. The question, the question asks, is there any uh, anticipated or likely change in relation to the percentages uh, that the government has indicated? Well, if you go to the white paper, it's silent in relation to the um, uh, those sorts of granular detail. Um, however, 
uh, you will see, I think it's in paragraph uh, 1.23, that um, one of the paragraphs which concerns communities does uh, spell out in terms that the infrastructure levy will be more transparent than section 106, quote, and local communities will have more control over how it is spent. So picking up on the 15 or 25 percent point, one can see that uh, carve out uh, perhaps being uh, uh, expanded in terms of what the parish can and can't do with it uh, as uh, uh, quite a useful revenue stream. I think uh, regardless in many ways of whether the percentage may be changed, this is perhaps a, a, as important a point. If one remembers that what's been foreshadowed is a change from uh, the scope of the uh, resource base from new development, which uh, results from the establishment of floor area within a built envelope to also encompass simply a change of use without any other new physical development, then the financial resource base expands quite dramatically. And 15 or 25 percent of that increased base is probably quite a lot of extra revenue coming through to a parish uh, and to an able plan. So coupled with that, um, there's obviously no cap on the amount of the 25% uh, that uh, may be uh, uh, drawn down, as it were, by the parish council, which has an able plan. And so there's a very big financial incentive for local communities to uh, get and adopt neighbor plans and um, it's also uh, equally a reminder to developers um, and particularly unwary developers that neighbor plans re remain uh, potential titanically destructive to their development proposals and therefore there's probably another incentive to get your development going quicker rather than waiting for a neighbor plan to come into come on stream i hope that helps uh, yes, that's that's great. Thank you. Uh, I've got a question uh, for, for, for John, actually. John, you, you um, in the interest of time, you understandably um, skipped over the 10 the 10 principles distilled, I think, in the rectory case on interpretation. Um, that seems to me to be probably quite important for, for listeners in, in practice. Um, do you want to spend a couple of minutes just on, on that? Is it, uh, and are they are, are they really a distillation of existing principles? Or is there anything new in there that people should be aware of? Well, my view is it's a distillation of existing principles. But uh, again, like Keith Lindblom, David Holgate seems to be doing what he can to try and uh, make the, the case law that much clearer now so that uh, you've got, as it were, one source case to go to. Uh, I think where um, David Holgate's judgment um, takes matters, as it were, um, to perhaps um, a different level, Stephen, is providing as a, a structure within which you can test these particular matters. And one sees the same approach being taken in DB symmetry as well on the interpretation of conditions. And there seems to have been a judicial consciousness to try and actually set out matters in such a way to try and um, avoid challenges that just raise these issues without actually carrying out any sort of granular analysis of whether or not there is a genuine point of law that, that is actually being raised or whether or not it's just an attempt to try and delay matters or try and um, get something as well to a different stage from that which it was in previously before you got to court. Great. I mean, I think it's to be welcomed, isn't it? I, I mean, I suppose the court, the planning court, is getting rather fed up of being presented with an, you know, a plethora of 10 cases to establish some fairly obvious point. So uh, yeah. the, the consolidation is probably probably quite welcome actually. Indeed. Uh, yeah and I've got a final question Christian um, on, on the, the new the new SIL um, as proposed I, I mean obviously a lot of emphasis on affordable housing but it did strike mm -hmm. me there's an awful lot of what might be called environmental infrastructure that's going to be needed in years to come following on from my opening remarks really so you know things like the enhancement of the natural world, uh, tree planting, uh, infrastructure for uh, e renew for renewables and green forms of energy, and so on, uh, charging for electric vehicles, all of those, all of those things. Huge amounts of money are going to be required to be ploughed into those. Um, and I'm wondering whether is is the joined up thinking? I mean, is still being considered in in the light of those those new imperatives? 
<laughs> yes, I, I, I think the way to think about it is, is this, that, that the, the, the Treasury, obviously, from the white paper terms, is, is seeing that there's a, a large amount of money, some £7 billion, coming through into local government through planning obligations. And it's identified that some £5 billion is for affordable housing and that negotiations result in delay. Now, this seems to me to be simply a hook by which to justify a change to the regime and a you know, convenient hook, a, a good hook, and probably a, 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 the, a right hook, no pun intended. Um, once the regime is changed, there's obviously a whole host of other things that one can do uh, with, with, with the, the, the regime. And one of the things I highlighted at the outset of the discussion was that the definition of infrastructure is embedded in the Part 11 of the Plan Act 2008 and is drawn very widely and inclusively. And the reason for the photographs that I included about the Scout Hut and the, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, drainage system in the city decaying is that as with all statutory uh, definitions, if you go to the, the dictionary and simply look up what infrastructure means, it's in its ordinary meaning, it is very, very broad. So yes, uh, I would imagine that uh, the funds that are generated by development could be applied to all sorts of things that would be uh, locally uh, described for whatever purposes were there, whether they're uh, communications infrastructure, uh, telecoms, electricity, park benches, and so forth. And you must remember, of course, as we all do, that in the virus context, we are still, as Rishi Sunak indicated, in the umbrella of uh, the virus situation itself, we haven't yet begun to pick up the economic pieces of it. And so we're going to be in a financially strapped situation going forwards for a number of years where revenue sources will be very important. So I think we can see SIL as being quite a, a good contributor to local infrastructure across a wide range of things, including as you describe yourself. Thank you. Thanks very much. Well, I think that's sort of exhausted the uh, situation. Thank you, John, for that, that lovely slide you put up uh, with the questions. I should clarify, I don't think that's a photograph of John's house in Norfolk, actually, in case you were wondering. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, thanks very much for listening. Um, we welcome feedback on this. So um, if you do have ideas for topics that you'd like to be covered in the area of planning, environment or property, in seminars or webinars in 2021. Please get in touch with us and let us know. We really welcome those suggestions. Um, so I think it all remains to say, you know, thank you for listening. Uh, as John said, the, the slides will be available on, on the website from tomorrow. So you'll have those. And um, I wish you all from the three of us uh, all the very, very best for the remainder of this year uh, for a happy Christmas. And of course, for 2021. And we look forward to uh, seeing you uh, hopefully in the flesh uh, in 2021. So thank you very much uh, and goodbye from myself, uh, Christian, and from John. Thank you and goodbye. Yeah, thank you.